And we have two children, a 10-year-old girl and a 3-year-old boy, who's an absolute nightmare right now. Um, this is going on YouTube, you realize. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. I won't name him. He's a film. Um, so we came to, we're going to be talking to you tonight about the theology of the body, which is what we always talk about. Um, but in particular, we're going to be talking, and you know, we've all heard a lot about this, but when we were talking about, well, what do we want to say, what do we want to discuss, we're all dealing with this, uh, these scandals that are going on of sexual abuse and um, um, cowardice and all kinds of Injustice. unchastity, but you know, all, all kinds of bad behavior having to do uh, mostly with sex and how one lives out one's sexuality, and especially with uh, clergy, uh, bishops even, and cardinals. So we thought we'd talk about that, but we want to talk about it from a theology of the body point of view. So what we're going to talk about tonight is celibacy for the sake of the kingdom. Um, and to do that, we have to talk first about marriage. So we'll start doing that. So how many of you are familiar with uh, the theology of the body, exactly what that is? Paul, right? Victor. Victor. Why would I think he was a Paul? I don't know. Um, nobody else is familiar with the theology of the body. A little bit. Okay. So the theology of the body is what the name given to a, a group of teachings by John Paul II, St. Pope John Paul II, uh, when he became Pope. And really this goes back to when he was a bishop in Poland as well, all the way back to when he was a university prof professor of philosophy. Um, he had, as you know, lived through two very trying times in the 20th century that played out in Poland in a really powerful and profound way. He first lived through the Nazi occupation of Poland and then the Soviet um, rule, puppet rule of Poland. And in that whole, and then as a bishop, he lived through what is called the sexual revolution. Does anybody know what that is? Familiar yeah. with what that is? What we'd like to say in brief what the sexual revolution was. The 60s, I think, it probably began in the 60s with the, what they call the hippie revolution, uh -huh. a free love movement. Yeah. So what exactly was that? What do you mean? What, what, is free, what do they mean by free love? Well, it was like more of a reaction against uh, the uh, per perception of um, the uh, conservatism of the politicians and, and the leaders in the churches. And so it was like a, a reaction. Well, look at us. We can vote the one we want. You know, yeah. we can tell them what to do. Vote the watch. And they went very public with it, you know. Of course, uh, it hate Asbury in uh, San Francisco. Mm -hmm. it, it really was a, a mess. I was out there in 69, boy. You talk about it, it, it looked like a war zone. It was so worn down, torn down. The hippie revolution really uh, moved very quickly from uh, San Francisco in 63. And I think the Woodstock in 69 and then uh, Isle of Wight in England in 70. That was probably the end of it. Mm -hmm. But the repercussions of that were this free love movement. Uh, do what you want, you know? Yeah. I would also add to that the, um, the widespread acceptance and um, distribution of contraceptives. Um, they go hand in hand. So if you're going to have sexual relations outside of the context of marriage, with whomever you want, whenever you want. The thing that tie, always tied sex to marriage before that, if not the teachings of the church about the morality of that act, but at the very least it was childbearing. If you were going to engage in that activity, everybody knows and knew at the time and still knows that when you have sex, one of the natural results of that is babies. And if you were going to have this sexual revolution where you were going to throw off the supposed shackles of sexual morality, then you had to have this contraceptive component. And also abortion, um, the abortion license, grew up alongside of that. Uh, in the beginning, you know, we were told, uh, or society was told, that abortion was going to be something that was a last resort. Um, and people warned that the slippery slope would be that eventually it would be used as birth control. And they said, no, that would never happen. But of course, that's exactly how we see it used today, unfortunately. And if you think about it now, we're half 
century, we're 50 years past that, right? Beyond 50 years since the 60s and the 70s, right? About half a century. And your generation, those in college now, don't know a time when society protected sex as something between a man and a woman within marriage, right? That is so foreign to um, the understanding of the generations that are just raised in um, just the current mainstream culture. That seems so long ago. It seems ancient, you know? So we ask this question, do you even know what the sexual revolution is? Because um, I am a national family planning uh, practitioner for the diocese, and before I begin my presentations on national family planning, I try to give some background as to theology, um, as to why the church teaches that contraception is wrong. And I have discovered that a lot of the people in the audience have no idea about the sexual revolution. They don't even realize that the way society functions now is due to a really important historical event in the 60s and the 70s in America. And so that they don't understand the roots of, of the modern world and, um, and its thinking about sexual license. So this is relevant because we are living in the consequences of that revolution now. And we are reaping the consequences from living out this freedom, this freedom not for something, but freedom from something, right? Because the sexual revolution allowed people to say, I am free from morality, not free to love as God loves, not free to give myself completely to another person, but free from any sort of constraint. So you have to remember that the concept of freedom and where we stand with freedom in America always seems to be freedom from something. Like, oh, I don't want this person to oppress me, or I don't want this person to influence me. I want my freedom. What's the whole point of becoming 18 and moving out of your parents' home? It's I'm free from them, right? But we take our freedom for granted because we've always had it in America for ever since, you know, hundreds of years. We, we know that we have this level of freedom, and we forget that freedom was given to us for something, not just to re reject um, a teaching or something else, but in order to live out a life of greater dignity. So back to John Paul II for a, a moment. Um, another key event that happened along this in this same time frame, 1968, was the promulgation of the encyclical letter Humanae Vitae, is everybody familiar with that uh, encyclical letter? No, okay. So Pope Paul VI, um, you've got the sexual revolution going at full steam by this time. And many, even many Christian denominations, this started way back in the 1930s when contraception first became something that was actually, I should say, chemical contraception became... Well, what was the 30s? In the 30s, it was about um, prophylactic um, barrier-type methods. Okay. So in the 30s, the Anglican Church allowed married couples only to use prophylactic, prophylactic barrier-type methods of contraception. That's sort of the beginning of the uh, crumbling of the walls. Then, in, as the sexual revolution gains full steam, many Christian denominations began to allow um, their people, their, um, the members of their congregations, to use contraceptives, always within marriage. And at this time, um, there was a big uh, push for this to happen within the Catholic Church. And in fact, many Catholic theologians, priests at the time, were telling people in the confessional that go ahead and use contraception because the church is going to change your teaching on this. The church had always maintained that contraception was a violation of the marriage uh, of, of marriage. And uh, so many people were saying that the church is going to change her teaching on this. She has to. She has to get with the times and so on and so forth. So Paul VI, Pope Paul VI, um, created a, um, a group of scholars, theologians, and so on to study this question. They came back and the majority report said that the church should change her teaching. Well, he shocked the entire world when in his encyclical letter, Humanae Vitae, he confirmed and affirmed the church's constant teaching that contraception violates the goods of marriage. And there was a huge revolution about this. So back to John Paul II. He's seen the brutality of the Nazi regime. He's seen the brutality of the Soviet political machine. He's now seen the wreckage that was 
uh, heaped upon humanity by the sexual revolution in terms of broken families, dysfunctional relationships, children born out of wedlock, um, all those kinds of things, abortion. Paul VI talks about a lot of these things in Humanae Vitae. Um, then he's seeing the reaction to the release of Humanae Vitae. There was widespread dissent, something that we probably can't even imagine today. I didn't live through it, um, but I've read about it. Uh, huge numbers of priests and religious left uh, the, their, their lives as priests and religious. Catholics turned away from the church in huge numbers, or if they didn't, they just started using contraception with no regard for the Pope's teaching, because they said, this doesn't make sense in my life. So the Pope saw this, or at the time, uh, Bishop Wojtyla saw this, and said that although the teachings of Humanae Vitae were correct, he believed them 100%, they were composed in a sort of natural law framework that he thought that modern man was unprepared to accept, that the philosophical foundations for that way of viewing the question were no longer adequate, and that he needed some new way to propose what he called an adequate anthropology, meaning what is this, what is a way that we can understand who we are, where we're going, where we've come from, and how to live. Who are we and how do we live? And so when he became Pope, this was sort of the fruit of his whole life's work really as a pastor, as a priest, as a theologian, as a philosopher. Um, for five years, in his general Wednesday audiences, he proposed this teaching, which, is, which we now call the Theology of the Body. And sort of the, uh, the scriptural touchstones for the teaching are the creation accounts in Genesis, um, the Pharisees' questioning of Jesus in the 19th chapter of Matthew, where the Pharisees asked Jesus, Moses, allowed us to, Moses permitted us to divorce, what do you say? Jesus has answered that question. The fifth chapter of Ephesians, where Paul talks about marriage and its connection between Christ's relationship with his church. Um, there are some other scriptures that are interspersed throughout there, but that's basically what the theology of the body is. So we need to talk now, that you've got that background, we need to talk to you about what marriage is according to scripture and how the Holy Father, John Paul II, um, brings this out of those scriptures. Do you want to jump in there? No, okay. So he starts with Genesis and the creation accounts, and it's a, it's a beautiful um, analysis of these scriptures. And really, um, I don't want it to come across as though it's something totally novel, because you can see, once you've read the theology of the body, you can go back and read the fathers of the church, and you'll see, and the scriptures, and you'll see the theology of the body everywhere. Like all true development of doctrine, it's not something new or something opposed to what came before. It's a development of what came before. It's, it's taking something that was intrinsic to the Catholic faith and making it extrinsic so that we can see it. So he goes back to Genesis and he goes back to the creation accounts. And God creates everything and he pronounces it good. Then he makes man and the first man looks around and God gives him the, the task of naming all the animals. And as he does this, um, he realizes that he's different from every other creature that he finds. And that he's alone. He realizes that he's alone. The Pope calls this original solitude, the state of man in the beginning. So what was that state of original solitude? He recognizes that he alone, of all the visible creatures, is a person. He has freedom, and he can receive. So what is he supposed to be receiving? He alone is capable of recognizing that creation all of creation is a radical gift given to us by God. If you think about this for a second, it makes total sense because God in himself is perfect. He needs nothing. He wants for nothing. He's fully actualized. He is his love. He is his justice. He is mercy. He's not, he doesn't stand in potency to any of those things, so he needs nothing. So why did he create? Out of love. Out of love. And so man alone is capable of recognizing that everything that he sees around him is a gift to him, given to him in love. And that he alone is, from all the other creatures in the world, he alone is capable of receiving this gift. But that solitude also said, teaches him something else. He is supposed to receive this gift, and he recognizes that he's supposed to recapitulate this gift that this is like the purpose of his life. 
And so it's the first time in Scripture when he realizes that, that God says it is not good. Up till that point, everything that he had done was good. But he says at that point, it is not good for the man to be alone. So well, then what does he do? Does everybody know? Puts him to sleep. And does what? Surgery, takes the root. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he, he puts man to sleep, and he creates woman. And when Adam awakes, um, he sees Eve, and he says what? Does anybody know? Victor slash Paul. <laughs> this one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. In and through his body, and in seeing the body of Eve, with the perfect, what John Paul calls the peace of the interior gaze, this perfect vision, he sees that in and through their bodies, at last he has found someone to whom he can make a gift of himself. Now his body makes sense, and her body makes sense to him immediately when he sees that. It says they're naked without shame. Their shamelessness, in the good sense, not in the bad sense that we know it today, but their shamelessness before each other in their nakedness means that their bodies and the way that God intended for the body to work was to reveal the invisible. The human body recapitulated the sacramentality of all creation. Yes? Could you clarify the, that interior gaze thing? What, a little lost on me. So, the body was intended not just to be, and we are, and this is the, the case today, that we've never lost this. The body is not just this bit of matter, you know. Uh, it's not like a shell of a soul. Right. We are a body-soul composite, and our bodies express our personhood. So, when I look at Jasmine, I don't just see this particular bit of flesh and bone. Her body reveals to me who she is, not just what she is. And that's unique among us creatures, that we can see that and that we can recognize that. And it's pretty innate and, and fundamental to our understanding of the human person is also, you know, the physical, the soul, the mind, the heart, all of that is so integrated, which is why this idea that gender is fluid violates the actual dignity of the human person because God created us in his image and likeness and so when we can strip that away and say that my personhood does not include my sexuality like who I am made um, in the image and likeness of God as man or as woman then we kind of destroy God's image of himself in us okay not that God has gender but he specifically created us male and female in a way that allows us to come outside of ourselves, okay? Because if we are left in that original state of solitude, we don't seek the other, then we seek to fulfill our, 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 uh, our reason for being and that we were created for love, by love, to love. And so our bodies are stamped with this image that reminds us that we were called to go outside of ourselves. And so that's what you mean by that interior gaze, right? So that, develop that. Well, I was going to say what Jasmine was saying leads to another sort of definition that we need that John Paul talks about called the spousal meaning of the body. So in addition, to that, and this is something that, that, in, that piece of the interior gaze uh, uh, was part and parcel of. So man, the first man and woman recognized by seeing each other in their bodies that their bodies were made and therefore their persons were made to make a gift of themselves. They were made for what the Pope calls intersubjectivity, that they were made to interpenetrate one another in terms of their shared life of love. It's hard for us to understand because after the fall, what goes before the fall is ultimately a mystery to us. The, the conjugal life of Adam and Eve had this perfect dimension of intersubjectivity, which we can't quite get to now. We can approach it because of the redemption of our bodies through Christ, but ultimately that will only be fulfilled in the eschaton, in heaven. So, I need to back up a little bit. So that spells meaning the, oh yes. I was gonna ask, isn't it arguable that Adam and Eve did not have sexual relations before the fall? Yeah, the Pope talks about that. Um, and that they were tempted right away and fell right away 
and that's why, like, when the conjugal act did happen amongst them, that's why the first, their first offspring, be it Cain or Abel, was, like, already stained with original sin, and, like, it's almost like, well, I guess some theologians have debated that. Before the fall, the eating of the forbidden fruit, there was no sex, but I don't know. Well, we got to be really careful here, because John Paul says that we don't know whether the call to self-gift uh, before the fall resulted in actual sexual union. He says that we don't know that. But what we think of as sexual union uh, before the fall really had a much fuller meaning, meaning. And it involved this whole conjugal relationship, which meant the giving and the receiving of one's person. And that's where I think it's so hard for us to understand particularly if you're saturated in our current culture and our secular society and it's like over-sexualization because our society makes it seem as though sex simply is an exchange of bodies, right? That's not what God has called it to be. That's not what he created to be. It was created to be an exchange of persons and it was, ex it was created to be a sign of what God is calling us to with him. An exchange of persons with God an intimate union with God. And so one of the main, main things from the theology of the body that is so important to understand is that God creating us in his image and his likeness and God creating us in a call for communion, that that sexual desire that is given to all of us is not something that is to be repressed or considered um, undignified because it's twisted by lust but to go back and see what the original intent was. And the original intent, um, that desire, that eros, that, that, that erotic desire, was put into us in order to call us out of ourselves towards the infinite, okay? So I have a quote here from Christopher West. He says, um, let's see, we all experience that ache of solitude and long for it to be filled. So an example, <laughs> you know, when you're a kid, you're, you may be happy playing by yourself, you may not really notice, um, you know, how many friends you have, you may or may not, it just, it kind of depends. But once you hit those teen years, those friendships become pretty important, right? As you start to develop and grow, and you start to grow outside of your own um, understanding and, and to mature and, and to become more like an adult, you understand that you were called for relationships. And this is just um, universal to all of us. And he says, however, that longing is not finally and completely satisfied simply by union with another being, as John Paul too rightly observed in Love and Responsibility, his uh, philosophical work that proceeds the theology of the body. Christopher says, in fact, if Eros is truly a cry of our hearts for the infinite, then the marriage we really desire is the one already promised us, the marriage of the Lamb. So what I'm trying to get at is that our creation, our, um, our being made in the image and likeness of God, our creation for union, our creation um, by love, for love, and to love is pointing us to him. It's pointing us to heaven. And then that sexual union was meant to point us to heaven. And that marriage was supposed to be the primordial sacrament that points us to heaven. So like with all the sacraments, you, the sacraments reveal an invisible way, an invisible reality, right? So marriage is called the primordial sacrament because it was there at the beginning. And it was the original way that God intended to reveal His covenant of love with all of creation through these two human persons. And so, like all sacraments, uh, marriage is a sign. What is it a sign of? It's a sign of the the union, the deep, personal, intimate communion that God desires to have with all of us in heaven and that he's calling us all towards. He's calling us to marriage. Yes. With him. Okay? Does, does that make any sense, like, the idea that God actually wants to marry you? I mean, what do you think it means when we receive his body? It says, take and eat, take my body into your body. You see that imagery there? That God wants to be so close to us that he gives us his own body. Where else do we see that? Right? What other sacrament do, does somebody give their body away in love? Which one? 
Matrimony. Matrimony, right? It's so intertwined and it's all throughout the Bible. The beginning of the Bible, the creation of um, Adam and Eve in Genesis, it starts off with um, be fruitful and multiply, right? And then Revelation, what is that? That is a wedding banquet, a wedding feast. And smack in the middle of the whole Bible is Song of Songs, which is love poetry. And the saints, um, in reading Song of Songs, they recognize in this really intense, intimate poetry um, the calling that God is calling them to in their spiritual um, ecstasy, in a sense. Okay, So the reason we're going back to the significance of marriage and the significance of um, its dignity and how it stands into each of us that we're called into union is because in the midst of all these scandals and in the midst of um, the struggles and the failures of just human persons to live out God's calling, what do people immediately clamor to? What do they say needs to change in the church to fix this? Celibacy. And why do they think celibacy needs to be removed in order to fix um, abuse situations? Why, why do they immediately think that that's the answer? I think celibacy is uh, misinterpreted for one thing. They see it as a physical thing. You know? Or uh, obviously, I'm, I'm a celibate and I don't have sex. No, it's celibacy can, it's for married people too. You know, if, if your state of mind or your state of heart but in my heart, in the mind and the heart, it's that condition whereby you realize that it's just you and Jesus or you and God. That's all there is, really. <laughs> you know, and so, I mean, I, I may not be too fun to know here, but celibacy is an interior thing as well as exterior, of course. Yeah. You can't say you're celibate and go out and, you know, screw everybody, whatever, do, do whatever you want. Right. No. If you say you're celibate, okay, you're celibate, but you're also celibate interiorly, which is the, the root of the root of every, everything good comes from within, and everything bad comes from within. So celibacy is being uh, firmly rooted in the goodness of God, which is in you. Right. And so I'm going to quote here. Um, from Christopher West again, he says, celibacy does not cause sexual disorder. Sin does, right? Something from mm -hmm. within. Simply getting married does not cure sexual disorder. Christ does. And that's just a really important um, thing to understand. Because if you are called to the vocation of marriage, and you think that marriage is just simply licensed for sexual fulfillment, then you don't have the interior of a chaste person. And so even though you're having sex within marriage, and therefore, legally it's correct, you may still be lusting after your wife. You may still be objectifying your husband. Okay? So this understanding of what our sexual um, desire, what we are created for, what our bodies are for, what, what it means to be a human person is fundamental for everybody's vocation. Single, celibate, um, religious orders, marriage. It's fundamental to all of us. It's fundamental for our growth towards union with God. So living out that spousal meaning of the body, um, John Paul says that that reveals really the meaning of our existence. The spousal meaning of the body is the body's power to express love. It's the body's, it's the body's power to manifest the, re the reception of the gift and to recapitulate that gift in making a total donation of oneself to one's wife in marriage. So if that's the meaning of, if that's what the spousal meaning of the body means for marriage, then the question is, well, what is celibacy for the sake of the kingdom? That Jesus obviously calls and did call in scripture people to and lived out himself, did he not? Jesus was celibate. So he lived out this calling himself and he definitely calls people to it in scripture. So the question is, is celibacy just the eschewing of sexual relations? No, it is not. Unfortunately, if you read a lot of the commentary about what's going on right now, you'll get a lot of warped um, perspectives about what celibacy is, even from Catholic commentators. Unfortunately, I think this theology of the body is not well known enough, because I read it as someone who's 
read and studied this and lived with this for a long time, and I'm like, how could he think that about celibacy? He's obviously not read the theology of the body. If he did, then he'd know that celibacy for the kingdom, if marriage is a sign that points us, and this is why, for example, when you get married, you're not allowed to go off to the beach as a Catholic. You know, you're not allowed to elope as a Catholic. You have to get married in a church. It has to be in public because there's a public dimension to marriage because it's a sign to everyone around you and to the entire world of this union that Christ is calling us to with himself in heaven. Now, like all signs, when the reality becomes present, the sign is no longer necessary, right? If we're trying to get to SeaWorld and it says SeaWorld, no one's going to SeaWorld anymore. If we're trying to get to uh, Disney World and the sign says Disney World 50 miles, Disney World 25 miles, Disney World next right, when we finally get to Disney World, we don't need any more signs for Disney World because we, the reality is now present to us. And for Jasmine, Disney World is practically like heaven, so this is a good analogy. So we don't need the signs once the reality is present, which is why when the, fair, the Sadducees, who were sort of the free-thinking wise guys of, uh, of uh, Jesus' time, when they ask him this trick question about the woman who's been married seven times and in heaven whose wife shall she be, remember that? They didn't believe in the resurrection of the, of the dead. So they were trying to trip him up and show him how stupid this idea was. And he says, he answers them uh, in the way that only Jesus could. He says, in heaven they neither marry nor are given in marriage. Why do you think he says that? They're, they're, they're married to God, and they, that's why they're in heaven, so to speak. Exactly. But heaven's in them or whatever. So he reveals, in that scripture, he reveals that marriage is a sign. And that eventually, in the eschaton, in the end time, in heaven, in the final fulfillment of the entire cosmos, of all creation, we will be in this perfect, total, intersubjective communion with God and with each other, I have to tell you. We are all going to be living in communion with God and in and through one another. That's the intersubjectivity that we're being called to in heaven. So you better get used to each other right now. Because <laughs> you're going to know each other perfectly in heaven, in God. So that's the sign. The marriage is the sign of that union. So what is celibacy for the kingdom? It is the next step of that sign. It's living out in a fuller way that spousal meaning of the body. So if marriage is a sign that eventually will go away when the, the, that reality is present, celibacy for the kingdom is, in a provisional way, living out that union, that perfect intersubjectivity. So the celibate is not somebody who just doesn't have sex. A celibate, a celibate is not someone who uh, turns away from the good of marriage. His decision to be celibate is a confirmation of the goods of marriage. What the celibate is saying is that that sign is so good that I'm going to take that sign one step further and I'm going to live out in a provisional way here on earth what that sign is pointing us to. I'm going to make myself fruitful I'm going to give myself in union to God here and now, right now, in my life. To be a sign of heaven here, right now. And so it's, you know, it's important to understand this because, you know, a lot of people erroneously conclude that if celibacy is so good, that marriage must be bad, right? I don't know about you, but I remember growing up being really confused because it seemed like all these things were virgins and martyrs. And so in my young mind, I thought, well, then that must mean sex is bad, right? Or even just the little tiny things that um, you do in, in order to try to be chased by turning away the eyes from that which is lustful, it's easy to twist and, and to begin to think that the body is bad. You know, those heresies of Manichaeism and dualism, all of these things that lead us to believe that the body's better. Even when we hear St. Paul's teachings in the scriptures um, in the New Testament and getting confused when he, when he talks about, you know, the spirit is good and the body is bad. It, it's twisted in a sense, not because of what St. Paul is saying, but because we look at it through this context. And if you think about it, even though we're here in the fruits of the sexual revolution, the sexual revolution is almost like this, um, the pendulum swinging way the other way from a puritanical understanding of our bodies, which is what America was founded in, 
that kind of a theology and philosophy, if you want to say it, right? Because we were founded by Puritan Protestants that believed that the body was, in essence, bad, right? And so that's this complete swing away from, from that idea with the sexual revolution. And so there may be these, um, these ideas that taint our understanding of our sexuality, particularly as we are trying to live a chaste life. Because the baby steps in living a chaste life, and let's define chastity. What is chastity? Because a lot of people don't, a lot of people limit chastity, um, their understanding of what chastity really is. So somebody, what do you think, give me a definition of chastity. I wasn't going to give a definition, but I was going to ask like along those lines if you could differentiate for us the distinction between abstinence and chastity. Right. So that's exactly what I was going to get at, because people think chastity is abstinence. And that's not an adequate definition of chastity. Because is a married couple called to be chaste? Yes. Are they called to always be abstinent? So does it mean when they're not abstinent that they're being unchaste? No. <laughs> okay. So chastity is not simply um, the exclusion of sexual relations, right? So chastity is loving rightly in and through our bodies. Okay? So chastity for a single person, living rightly in and through their bodies, revealing the truth of who they are in their bodies, would be um, to be abstinent, right? Because they have not made a covenant with another person in which the exchange of their bodies reflects, the union of their bodies is reflecting that covenant. Because every time somebody fornicates and has sex outside of marriage, they're saying a lie with their body, okay? Because that expression of one giving themselves to another, that sexual union, was meant to image God's complete union um, that he desires with us, but also um, the inner life of the Holy Trinity, which is a complete exchange of persons, the Father and the Son, and therefore the Holy Spirit. Um, and so God designed the nuptial union, the conjugal union, to image that. And so when you do this outside of marriage, that is no longer that. It is a counterfeit. It is not what God created it to be. So, chastity for the married person is not simply limiting sex to marriage and simply not contraceptive. If you do that, great, at least you got the bare minimum. But it doesn't mean that you're living your marriage chastely. It may mean that you're avoiding deeper sins <laughs> uh, regarding uh, lust, but it doesn't mean that the self-control and self-mastery has entered into the marriage and is mature. Because a mature love requires self-control and self-mastery. A mature love requires denying yourself for the good of the other. Okay? It's, it's going from the erotic initial attraction, eros, to agape, which is love which puts the other first. Perfect love. Can, can there be a jump right away to the agape? Or do you need to go through everything? Through the attraction, <laughs> erotic, and then come to the final when you're really ready to sacrifice. It's interesting. Is this, is this something put in us by God in order to, or can we really it's interesting skip that you say that. this, you know? It's well, interesting. They, okay. they, they can happen simultaneously, but there's always, if you're talking about um, the love between um, a married couple, for example, there's always an erotic dimension to it. And what does that mean? Well, it means that the to be presented with this gift of this other person, uh, eros, the true function of eros is for me to draw, draw to, to reach out of myself, <coughs> to make a connection, to go into communion with this other person. And when that love becomes sacrificial, when I see this person as a good in herself, not as a means to an end for my own pleasure or for my own fulfillment or whatever. But when I see this person and respond to her in that way, now I've achieved agape. But there's always that erotic dimension. That erotic dimension is what's meant to draw us out of ourselves, which is why, you know, um, uh, masturbation, pornography, any kind of unchastity is really a, a warping, a deformation of erotic love. What does it do? Uh, Christopher West, who Jasmine's mentioned a couple times, he's a um, popularizer of the theology of the body. He's really written a lot of 
great work on the Pope's thinking. And he has this analogy of a rocket ship. And Eros is the fuel for this rocket ship that's supposed to blast off from ourselves to reach out to other people. Here he wrote right here, Eros was given to us by God precisely to lead us to the eternal marriage of Christ and the church. Right. And he also talks about it like a rocket ship. <laughs> um, and he says that he says that lust, which is the deformation of Eros, turns that rocket ship upside down. And it inverts us. Inverts us. So that ourselves. now we're only reaching within, which is why masturbation is always a deformation of authentic love because it's always reaching in, it's always about the self, right? and it's taking that sexuality, that sexual gift, and perverting it and making it all about me, when in fact the whole meaning of the thing, the whole meaning of sexuality is oriented toward communion with another. And so, so and so, I was going to say, in answer to your question, um, I don't think you would ever want to skip those steps that those steps are, are built in to being human. And even Pope and Benedict develops this, right, in his encyclical, um, when he talks about Eros and Agape and, and love, right? He talks about the fact that, you know, our understanding of controlling lust is to squelch Eros, to say there should not be any erotic desire. Because if there's erotic desire, we can't contain it. We've got to keep it contained. And if we keep it contained, then we'll avoid sin. And that's not what John Paul is teaching us in the theology of the body. That celibacy, that chastity, is not simply sexual repression and repressing the desire. It is reordering the desire, and it is redeeming the desire to point us to what it's originally supposed to point us to. So, Which is why I want to say real quick that even for the celibate, you wouldn't want to skip these steps. Like erotic love, eros is a dimension of human love, is there even for the celibate. It's the ordinary way of loving. And so it's a mistaken uh, view of celibacy that we should only reach this disinterested state of love. No. What the Pope is saying is that all people, all human persons, celibate or non-celibate, are intended to go out toward the other person. And it's precisely Eros that does this in us. So we can't but, just simply think that Eros is less. Because exactly. it's not. It's Eros turned and twisted and um, contorted is lust. But Eros in itself is just the desire to go outside of yourself. So for instance, let me give you... Oh, go ahead, Dan. Sorry. Um, and I, I feel like I kind of answered my own question <laughs> thinking about it. Um, but is, is Eros... Does Eros have to be directed at a person? Or is, could it, is it also be described as like being passionate about something? Um, I think it's, well, love, ultimately, authentic love, the, the fullness of love is always directed toward another person mm -hmm. or to God. I mean, it's, it's directed to God ultimately, um, and all of our love for other persons is ultimately, in an ultimate sense, directed toward God or, or ordered toward God. And so erotic love, human love, is really always a personal love. Mm -hmm. When I say that I love uh, philosophy, for example, I'm not using. I'm using that word equivocally. I'm not. I don't mean the same thing as when I say I love Jasmine. Obviously, you know, we know that. But I don't have an erotic desire for philosophy. <laughs> um, that would be weird, right? Um, so those dimensions don't really come into play there. I can be attracted to the good, to the true, to the beautiful that exists within that thing, but. This kind of love that we're talking about that has all these dimensions is really always oriented toward the And I think it's important to understand that when he says that, you know, that arrows that people need to go through these different stages, it doesn't mean it has to manifest in a conjugal union, right? So it's this desire to go outside of yourself. So maybe arrows in the single life is you have this desire to serve, this desire to love. And how do you do it as a single person? So like for example, when we were, in, uh, when we were dating, um, we could not express that desire for that conjugal union, that intimacy um, outside of marriage, right? Because that was not um, our current state. It wouldn't be faithful to our state to engage in those things. So this desire to go outside of ourselves, we chose to join various ministries when we were dating. One example is um, we were part of the Legion of Mary, 
And so we go to a mass at like 6 a.m. That's really hard when you're a college student, right? <laughs> Rarely get to you mass at right time. Into the cells, like professional one. <laughs> <laughs> right, we're trying to prepare for a sacrifice. We get up at 6 a.m. and then we would go and um, be extraordinary ministers and bring communion uh, to rehab hospitals. Do you know what I mean? So that's what that looks like in that state. Um, within marriage, this desire, not just the erotic desire and that mutual attraction, but there needs to be um, a sense of going outside of yourself. There, like, so one of the examples that Jim points out when we do our marriage preps and he's trying to attract the men is, you know, when a man gets home from work, he just wants a little time to himself, right? But he needs to get, he needs to take that moment and then come outside of himself and be part of that family, to go and engage with the children. What do you think is like one of, I, think, I don't know, you may, I may press some buttons here, or maybe I shouldn't say this, but I think one of the things that is um, dangerous in eroding men of their masculinity right now is video games, because it's teaching them to constantly just entertain themselves and go inward. When what makes a man a man is when he goes outward, he initiates. Like, that's part of the theology of the body. I'm going to say this to you guys, because this is a room mostly, yeah, all the girls left, it's just me. I'm going to say this to you. Um, one of the things that we see, in, and maybe you guys saw this in the dating project, if you guys watched the dating project last semester, and this is something I've heard, not just in watching that movie, but for over a decade, is that guys don't <coughs> ask women out anymore. And I've actually heard and I've seen this in my friends' relationships, that marriages in which women are the pursuer of the man, instead of the man being the pursuer of the woman, those marriages are not grounded well, because they are not reflecting what God created them to be. The man's physical body requires him to be the initiator of the conjugal gift, okay? He initiates, it's stamped in his body. And men need to live that reality. They need to go out and I'm sure it's really hard, but, you know, to go out and initiate that love, to go out and ask to spend time with a woman and maybe just have a cup of coffee in that, you know, just that low casual state. But, that, but the idea is that, you know, um, women do want to be pursued. pursued. Do they want to be used? No. But they want to be seen. They want a little reflection of that interior gaze, that the man sees them and sees their person and then that they're worth loving and that they go out and get it. And I'm just gonna say that, because I don't know who else is gonna say that to you guys, but that is what we are created for, and that particularly men are created for. And I, like, again, like I see it said, marriages where the man is the pursuer, they tend to be a lot more solid because the marriage is imaging what God created us for for man to be the head of the family, and the woman to be his equal and helpmate. But there has to be some dimension of, of what God originally created. And so I'm off on a tangent, but I felt like it was a good opportunity to, to talk about that. So yeah, give up video games, go ask somebody on a date. <laughs> That's, those are the tips for tonight. Um, but to get back to celibacy for the sake of the kingdom, I want to um, sort of finish up here on that. Um, we talked about how celibacy is the, the, really the fulfillment of that which marriage is a sign of, living that provisionally here on earth. Um, so very important for people who are considering the priesthood. When a person discerns the priesthood, he doesn't think to himself, or at least John Paul says he shouldn't think to himself, um, I really want to bring the Eucharist to people, and therefore, I am going to accept celibacy as a condition of that. John Paul says that a person who's discerning the priesthood needs to discern celibacy. He needs to discern living out the gift in this particular way and choose it intentionally and deliberately. That that's, that's absolutely essential for the priesthood. It's, you know, in, in, the, in the Roman Catholic Church, of course, um, we have this discipline of celibacy in the priesthood. It's not, as we know, it's not a doctrine that um, a man, a married man could never be a priest, but we have this discipline of it in the Roman Catholic Church. Um, and it really is, the purpose of that discipline is to show this gift of celibacy. I was reading about St. Ambrose, the great uh, 
uh, Bishop of Milan from the fourth century this morning. And he was instrumental in St. Augustine's conversion, a great preacher, tireless uh, worker for the people. As a bishop, um, he was seeing people, and Augustine attests to this in his confessions, he's, he's seeing people all day long. He stopped to eat, to read, and to sleep. That's it. He stopped to eat so he could nourish his body. He stopped to sleep so he could refresh his body. He stopped to read so that he could uh, refresh his wisdom and give that gift back to the people. On his deathbed, he laid out on the bed in the shape of a cross. And he couldn't say anything until they brought him viaticum. He received the Lord, he blessed them, and then he died. That is the celibate in action. A person who had made such a radical gift of himself to his people that it consumed everything that he did. And in the end, what did he witness to? He witnessed to the person of Christ, to those around him. Even in his body, as he was dying, he made the shape of the cross. That's what the celibate is choosing. That's what the celibate is showing the world. That's what celibacy for the kingdom is. It's not just, I'm deciding to do this and because, you know, being a priest and being married would be too hard, you know. That's not the point of celibacy. The point of celibacy is to show this dimension of God's covenantal love to the world. So it's really important, John Paul says, that people who are discerning the priesthood discern celibacy in this way. So that leads to another question, like, who should discern the priesthood? How would you know if you were a good candidate for the priesthood? Well, you would have to be self-possessed. Why would you have to be self-possessed, and what does that mean, first of all? Yeah? Is that just sort of another rung on dis of discipline? Yeah, it's really the end of discipline. Discipline is a means to self-possession. Why do I, uh, right now, I'm on uh, iteration number 432 of my battle against sugar addiction. And right now it's taking me Is it the video game? Uh, <laughs> no, just sugar. Just sugar. Right now it's taking the form of no sugar Monday through Saturday, and then on Sunday, like three bowls of ice cream and half bag of cookies. <laughs> That's this iteration of this, of this form of discipline. But what do I undertake that discipline for? Is it just so that I can become spelt and not eat, and not have acne anymore? No. The point of it all, ultimately, is to become self-possessed, to become the master of to my own free. person. And to be free. Why is that important, and why would that be important for a person discerning the priesthood? To be the master of oneself. Because you have to be able to be uh, physically alone, but, you know, have that constant spiritual outpouring towards the people that you serve and being able to have that um, mastery over your emotions and your mental state and all of the things that go along with being out and serving people all the time. And what do you think yeah. that source is going to come from? I mean, it has to come from God, right? It has because to come that's, from God. that's hard. It has to come from Christ. And, and I and I was going to say that the, the ultimate reason for that is that you can't give yourself away in this radical gift of yourself that the celibate is called to unless you first possess yourself. You can't give away what you don't first have. So all those things that you said just play into that. And I think that's why um, understanding celibacy or even chastity as repression will never allow a person to be free in, in the celibate state, in religious life, or in married life. Okay? There has to be a redemption of our sexuality, not simply a repression. And so a practical example of what that might look like, um, one of the things that Christopher West, again, the popularizer of theology of the body, one of the things he says is that when he sees an attractive person, a beautiful person, and he's a married man, right? He thanks God for their beauty. And instead of allowing that initial attraction to take him into lust, he sees their body and the attraction that is just that natural emotional reaction, that physical reaction that happens. And he orders it through God. And he thanks the person for their beauty. Thank you, God, for making this person beautiful to reveal to me your goodness, your truth. Okay? It's a very different way of dealing with our desires than repressing them and simply saying, I can't think about that. I can't think about it. It's just like, you know, when you're a kid and you're in the pool. And you try, to, you try to submerge the ball, and you try to like keep the ball under the water, 
and there's no way you can keep that ball under the water. You eventually explode and you're done. Because you're, you're exhausted. There's only so much strength that you have to keep that ball under the water before it pops up, right? And when chastity is simply repression, that is what happens. And so I, as, as I think anybody who studies theology of the body would recognize that this is the linchpin, this is the key to the crisis we are facing in our church today, is that all of us are called to the same redemption in our sexuality, and in particular, if this is something that we were living out before we even discerned our vocations, then we won't be as easy to pick off. The enemy will not be able to come and devour us as quickly because we know the attacks that, are, that we're being faced with, and we know how to fend them off. I've experienced this reality in my own um, in my own life and my own call to chastity. I know what chastity was like before the theology of the body, and I know what chastity was like afterwards. And it's far more successful when Christ redeems it. When you're not simply looking at um, any sort of attraction or erotic desire as something to be repressed, but as something that God sanctifies and seeing the good intent. You know, before we were, we dated a long time before we were married. And before I learned the theology of the body, it was just about, you know, okay, let's, let's wait till we're married, let's wait till we're married. But then after I learned the theology of the body, it was like, I don't even want to cheapen anything from the gift that God wants to give me in marriage. I don't want to taste something now and ruin, um, ruin the banquet that the Lord has in mind for me. And so this formation is just so fundamental, so important, um, I think, in being able to, to be free in this. And I think this is what the church needs, and I think John Paul knew that. I mean, even before I knew this broke, he knew that this is what, um, what our society would need. And so, you know, again, the theology of the body is not simply about celibacy or marital love or even sexuality. It is about what it means to be human and what it means to love and what we are created for. It's in everything. My husband and I talk about how we see it in everything. And I think the reason why it's in everything is it's because it is about Jesus Christ. It is about the incarnation, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And that's why it can permeate everything. Because everything is love to, in essence, right? I mean, God is love, and he's calling us to this radical love. And I'm going to end, I'm going to say, um, I'm going I'm to finish up this thought with a quote um, leading us back to the beginning of the theology of the body, and that to be human means we are called to communion, communion with God and one another in a rapture and bliss that will never end. That's the beatific vision, right? The communion of saints, to be in communion with God and with one another. This means that we are in the middle of a love story, says Pope Francis. Each of us is a link in this chain of love. And if we do not understand this, we have understood nothing of what the church is. I think this is really important because it's really easy to get caught up in our religious devotions and our pieties and forget the person next to us that we should be praying for, right? That we should be, um, not that we're supposed to you know, fix everyone's problems. Only God can fix our woundedness. Only God can fix our problems, right? But to be able to gaze at one another with love and to see the dignity of that person right next to you. Because to be a Christian isn't simply to follow the Ten Commandments, right? Because what happened when that man came to Christ and he said, you know, what do I need to do to enter the kingdom? And he said, follow the commandments. And, and he said, well, I'm already doing that. And he says, well, then go and sell everything you have. That means giving everything away. And so for some of us, that's going to be physically giving everything away materially. But to be poor in spirit is also to recognize how dependent we are on God and how everything is gift. And that person in front of you is gift, even if they make you crazy, like a little three-year-old. Okay, I'm always having to remember what a miracle he is. He is a gift. Right now, he's just in a really dirty wrapper. But he is a gift, okay? <laughs> so... Um, that's why the theology of the body can penetrate everything, because it really is calling us to see God's beauty and everything, and to see God's plan, and to see love, and to see redemption. So I'll finish by saying that, you know, I was just thinking as Jasmine was talking, in the Old Testament it says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And it always struck me as a beautiful saying, but um, if you think about it in the context of, the, of all of salvation history, that, begin, that word beginning is very important. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. 
What is the fulfillment of wisdom? Christ. Christ. Christ who definitively reveals God uh, to the human person. And the Second Vatican Council says that Jesus fully reveals man to himself. So what Jasmine's talking about in terms of how do we live out our faith? Well, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Do we have to follow the Ten Commandments? Absolutely. That's the beginning of wisdom. Should we have many pious devotions? Yes, that's the beginning of wisdom. What is the purpose of it all, of all those things? Come to Christ. Union with Jesus Christ. The Union, the person of Jesus Christ. To be formed in the heart by Jesus so that the law wells up from within us. I'm not going to, uh, I'm not tooting my own horn here or anything. I'm just talking about uh, the power that Christ actually gives for this redemption to take place. I was watching, um, I turned on the TV last night because I have to do my own laundry. But, um, <coughs> so I shrunk all his pants in the first year of marriage, and so he decided to not she let me watch. She puts chapstick in there, she shrinks things. I mean, my all my clothes would be ruined like overnight if I let her do my laundry. So I'm for, not as fastidious. For 17 years, I've been doing my own laundry, and I had to do a load of laundry last night, so I put it in the wash, and I needed to be able to put it in the dryer before I went to bed so it didn't sit in the wash all wrinkly. So I turned on the television um, to wait for this to happen. And I'm flipping through the channels, and I guess it was The Bachelor that I flipped across. And um, they were showing this one woman crawling into bed with this guy. And they had those like filters on the camera, like the night vision you know, stuff that they do. So anyway, they're, they get under the covers, and we're watching this on TV. And I was disgusted by it. Not disgusted by these people, who are children of God, but disgusted that they would take something so sacred and so holy and profane it in this way by not only doing it outside the context of marriage, but then doing it on television just for the prurient interest of everyone watching. And as I flipped away from it real quick, I was like, that has no power over me anymore. I don't need to be titillated by these things anymore. It has no attraction for me anymore. Precisely because, to whatever degree this is happening, the Lord is forming me from within so that the law is welling up from within me. So that I don't need any more. And St. Paul talks about this. This is what St. Paul means when he says that, I'm paraphrasing, I don't need the law anymore. I have become a law. The law is within me now. And Jesus, and the, the Old Testament scriptures talk about this all the time, that the Lord wants to write the law on our hearts not on tablets of stone, but in our hearts. And that's what the theology of the body has done for us. And, and that is the key. Long time. And that is the key to this, this crisis. Yeah. That it's, sinning is not even attractive at that point, yeah. if Christ redeems it. So, that's it. We're going to stop there, if you have any questions. We talked a lot, sorry. So, um, yeah, uh, I don't, like, uh, <laughs> mean to like ask like weird questions or whatever, but like I, I so guess Paul. Uh, <laughs> I guess we're gonna do it anyway. I think you're Paul, so okay. it's fine. <laughs> you're Victor, but I think you're Paul, so you can ask all the weird questions you want. Okay. You're in fair enough, fair enough. Um, so Father Chris had a very profound last week um, that I, if I if I'm not misquoting uh, Father Chris, uh, that everyone or certain people are called to celibacy, abstinence, but everyone's called to chastity because. Even those who are married, you know, they're, they're called to not be doing anything weird. Um, so, like, with that said, um, uh, aren't there certain, like, and this is why, like, you know, uh, like, pornography is, like, from the pits of hell and all that, because it completely, like, dehumanizes, like, people, and, like, pe people see that and, like, they want to, like, reenact it or whatever. So, um, aren't there certain, like, uh, sexual, like, positions that, like, are like condemned or like even within the confines of marriage that two people shouldn't like try experiment with because it is like degrading and it's it's objectifying. I would say that there are no if you go into the catechism and look in the index under sexual positions there are no entries there. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> but what is the point of conjugal relations? What is the point of sex between a married couple? Procreation. It has Primarily. two. Procreation and unification of the spouses, right? Yes. Which are linked directly. And even when the married couple is having sex, they have to do so chastely. 
That doesn't mean like Puritans cutting a hole in the sheets so that they never see each other's naked bodies. That's not what I'm saying, okay? But everything that they do together has to be directed toward the love of the other person as a person, as a good in herself or himself, not as an end, not as a means to an end in any way. So any sexual position in which One either person. of the persons feel this way, that this position, I feel objectified in this position, I feel like you're not loving me in this position, or, and the person, each person has a responsibility to himself as well to say, does this position or this activity, does this cause me to uh, give in to lust? Am I failing to see this person as a person who is an end in herself? because of this activity. If so, then it has no place. And, and you had mentioned a minute ago about imitation and pornography. So that struck me because that imitation, if somebody, is, is it so much that imitating particular things is wrong? No, it's that pornography puts in your head that I am after this activity mm -hmm. to create a specific response. And so when two people are in union in the marital act, if all they're trying to do is get a certain response, they have degraded the act. It needs to really be about self-gift. And the focus isn't on at a certain level of pleasure or anything like that. It really needs to be about self-gift. And so, um, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, chastity speakers, anybody, I mean, as an NFP teacher, what I <coughs> talk to my couples about is prayer before that union and, and asking the Holy Spirit to allow you to give yourself in a way that is pleasing pleasing to the Lord and to ask the Holy Spirit to be there so that the love is authentic and self-giving. And so that kind of gets away from this idea of, you know, X, Y, Z, A, B, C, crossing your T's and dotting your I's because it's not explicitly laid out. It's just like lust, you know. Does it say, I mean, yeah, certain things fall under lust, but lust is about the heart. It's about the interior, just like he said. Celibacy is about the interior. Chastity, chastity is about the interior. So when that interior is no longer corresponding with exterior, if that's not happening, then that's when, you know, you got to turn away. Good question. Any other questions? Um, as, uh, excuse me, as you develop friendships, you know, in the world and with people who aren't living chaste lives and who are very open about it, you know, what is, what has helped you live out sort of the practical apologetics for what authentic Christian love is um, when you're, when you're just at the bar, when you're chatting with friends at the gym? You experience that more at your work than I do. Yeah. I think at, um, at the root of my life, it's the root of my life, or at least my attempt at that, is to encounter Jesus. And that when I encounter Jesus through the scriptures, through prayer, through the Eucharist, through confession, when I encounter Jesus, he imparts to me something of his own merciful love. And really excluded from that altogether is any sort of um, like ultimate judgment, you know what I mean? The closer I come to Christ, the more I realize, the more I think about stories like um, Zacchaeus, the tax collector, you know? I think of Jesus walking through this town, and there's this little sh short Zacchaeus who climbs up on this tree, hated by everyone, you know? A betrayer of his people, a cheat, a liar, a thief, right? And yet, who is the one person in that whole crowd that Jesus says, Zacchaeus, I want to come dine at your house tonight? It's this guy. So. There's this great song that Jasmine and I have been listening to called uh, I will. So Will I. So, is it So Will I? So Will I. It's by this uh, Protestant group called Hills, Hillsong. And one of the lyrics in that song says, You're the one who never leaves the one behind. And the closer I come to Jesus, the more I encounter him, the more I see him in other, pre other people. And so that means that sometimes, if I'm led by that, I'm not talking about the faith with someone. I'm just being Christ to that person. You know? I mean, I deal with that all the time at work. So, like, I think what he's trying to get at, too, though, is, like, 
when you live out God's call to be chaste, to be a devout Catholic, it's a radical, it looks radical to the rest of the world. And so I think sometimes that living witness is more important than the words that we use for apologetics because you can't put a seed in ground that's not fertile. Do you know what I mean? And so I think from a practical point of view and encountering that, you have to let the Spirit lead you. And sometimes he, he leads you by simply not condoning, but not condemning and just refraining. When they say something that you find repulsive, you, you know, you obviously, your silence says a lot when you don't, um, and, and sometimes they're looking to be condemned, right? They're trying to provoke. They're trying to provoke. But if they just simply see your witness by how you live, the happiness in your relationships, the freedom that you have, the fullness in your life, then when that ground is right, then you can bring that in. I mean, one of my best friends, I couldn't talk to her at all about my faith or anything, and she lived, lived a very secular, different life. And I remember at one point, finally, God allowed me to say something to her. And she told me, how do you know you love somebody if you don't have sex with them? And it, it was until she was ready to ask that question that I can introduce this notion that the meaning of sexuality is so much more, you know? And it didn't go very far, but I knew if I brought it in earlier, she wouldn't have been able to hear. Do you know what I mean? So always pray. You know, uh, what, what does it say in the scriptures? That it's like you have to have a quiver of arrows, and you have to use the truth, like an arrow. But you have to know when to use it, right? Because you don't want to strike them dead. You want to set them aflame, right, for the Lord. So it's not, I just have to tell you, ask you to tell the Holy Spirit to do it, because I don't really have a set way of doing that. Does that make sense? But that's seeing, that's seeing the person. I mean, that's the, that's the theology of the body. And the other Just seeing a, a, a person created in the image and likeness of God, despite what he's doing, or even the, way, even the things that he's doing to disfigure that image in himself. Gosh, um, a person should be pitied for that more than anything else. It should inspire in us yeah. that merciful love that Jesus had when we see that, you know. I, I, uh, our pastor, Father Granito, um, when you talk to him about, um, you know, the fact that you're confronted by people who don't live out the gospel and they just don't seem to be serious about it, they're not real disciples of Christ, he likes to point out 99% of us, 99% of what you're dealing with is a broken heart and just trying to cope with your broken heart and that's what people are doing. They're living that out in that way, just trying to find fulfillment. And so, you know, recognizing that allows us to... Um, to not stand in judgment. Yeah, we judge, we know what's wrong, we know what's right. But it's a lot harder to witness um, if we're throwing stones. And I'm not saying you're doing that, mm -hmm. but just to remind ourselves mm -hmm. of that. I And I'm just one drop in the ocean of that person's life, too. You know, it's, it's a kind of pride, really, to think that I can turn this person around at, in one fell swoop. If the Lord wants that to happen, then he'll make that happen. It happened to me once when I was in college, uh, when a one was itinerant preachers, you guys probably have them here too, but they would come to, uh, to the free speech area at UT and there would be a big crowd listening to this guy and everybody was just heaping scorn on him and then when he would leave, it would break up into these little discussions and I was having this discussion with this Calvinist and this guy was listening the whole time and after it broke up, the guy said, I want to become a Catholic and then this is so like me I didn't follow up with him at all. <laughs> and then later on I found out he did enter the church. That had really nothing to do with me. It was just what he heard at that time, you know. But most of the time we're just a drop in the ocean of this person's life. And he, that person is on, if, if you're anything like me, you know, the Lord is drawing you along this journey. And it takes a long time to get where we're going most of the time. And he's patient with us, you know. So we have to be patient with those people. We have to be patient with ourselves, too. We have to realize Rome wasn't made in a day, you know. All right. Cool. I have one last question, sorry. Um, so how uh, is it possible for a husband to lust after his wife and vice versa if, like, they are married? Because um, it's possible to objectify your spouse and to see a spouse as, or even that act as, um, an indulgent of a desire. So like, you're just in the mood and I'm just going to use you to fulfill this and 
and not with the intentions of procreation per se in mind. You can you can do it legally correct. You know, yeah, I'm open to it. I will tell you this as an NFP teacher. I know plenty of people who follow the church's teaching from the get go in the sense that they have never contracepted and that they um, have been open to life and that they waited till they were married. But if you were to liken um, the marital act to music, okay? Some people bang on the piano keys, barely playing chopsticks. And some people can play a symphony. And in that situation, when you're just legalistically following the rules and just giving in to the urge without seeing the person, the husband or the wife can feel used. Because, for instance, a person who's like that can't say no and wait another five or six days. You know, sometimes people have large families because they're following the church's teachings, but not because of a generous heart. Sometimes it's simply lack of self-control. And I've seen that, working with them one-on-one. -on -one. I, you know, so how can it happen? It's because, like, I, I just got this desire, I gotta do something with it, this is legally okay, I'm just gonna do it, without recognizing the fact that, is that in the best interest for the family? Is it in the at best? At this point or whatever. At this point or whatever, okay? You can be open to life and still be used. But still be, and still be irresponsible. Yeah, yeah. And, and so um, I think, you know, it's just, and, and I know women who feel like if they're not always, always, always available, then their husbands won't, will have such a hard time. That's like giving much confidence in their men to know that they don't lust after other women and they don't lust after you. So that's what the redemption is all about, right? I can trust my husband because I'm not just keeping him at bay. I can trust him because I know that lust doesn't hold power over him. You know? And and it's it's sad to say, but people just kind of have this idea of like, okay, well, it's legal, it's okay. But what happens in marriage, like there's times when people have to abstain for extended periods of time, you know? And so that self-control is always necessary. All right. Yes, sir. So, uh, obviously, the, uh, the two grand overarching vocations of, uh, of the Catholic are either marriage or the religious life. So then, at what point, what has to kind of fall into place for someone to go, somebody who's like, well, I don't think I have what it takes to be a priest, I guess I better go get married. Like, what do you, what happens, what happens to those people? How do they get along? Is there anything that, that can be done? What do they have to learn? Where do they go if they feel like that? Oh, monastery. Yeah. I think that is a religious No, thing. not necessarily. It just can be, a, it can be a holding place for a while where you can learn how to, how to they might go on. Way. They might go on The Bachelor, the television show. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, for those people, it may just be a longer period of discernment. There's some question about whether um, the single life is a vocation as such. Sure. You know, um, I can verify it for 75 years. I've been single, ain't got no kids, no girlfriends, no wife, nothing. <laughs> but Jesus, hallelujah. You know, it's true. Yeah. You can be single. You don't have to be married. You can be a, a priest or a pope or nothing. You can just be a regular old bum on the street. As long as you know Jesus, that's the main thing. And Jesus will take care of you real good, too. And, well, I just say... The present Pope says this. The, the key is take care of the poor right now. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ to his people today. Take care of the poor. How many people do you see on the street now compared to five years ago? Oh, my God. Tons more. Yeah. For whatever reason, I, uh, a lot of reasons. But the thing is... The Pope knows that, and he's saying, look, see these people there? That's Jesus. Yeah. No, and I, gee, I, I don't know, I'm near that guy. Well, dear, on, the, on the internet, there's a thing on YouTube, I think, about this uh, church. I think it was uh, Evangelical Church, remember? And they had, they had lost their pastor. He was moving on, or he died or something. So they're waiting for their new pastor to come. So you know what the guy did? He dressed like a, the worst bum you could imagine. He sits in the back of the church, and he was scorned by everybody. And then, and then somebody said, now I want to introduce the new pastor. It was a guy, the bum. He come up, took up all the makeup off, and says, I'm a new pastor. And, and the, the thing was, most of the people uh, in the church were on their knees crying. 
See, that's the way Jesus comes to us like, he, he don't come to us like we want him to come to us. We, we want Jesus all nice and sweet and all. Yeah. Hey, you're going to come like somebody in the back of the church, a bum in the back of the church, drinking wine or, or, or beer or whiskey or something. And you don't know this until he starts to cause a ruckus. Yeah. Otherwise, who's that? Oh, that nice little man right there. But why did he cause a ruckus? He ain't going to kick him out. Call the police. Well, I'll just say that what what you're saying, I think, uh, has some validity. Leaving aside the theological answer to the question, is the single life a vocation as such? We'll just leave that aside. Um, everybody is called to bear fruit, to be fruitful in his love. And that's what you were talking about. Caring for the poor, whatever that, whatever, how, however that manifests itself. We're all called to make a gift of ourselves, even the single person. <coughs> and if the single person is doing that, then if he's going to be called into one of those vocations, I think the Lord will make it clear. If and he's it, living out that calling in an authentic way, it, the Lord will make it and clear. And just to be practical, it doesn't have to be grand. I mean, look at one of the doctors of the church, St. Therese, do all things with love, all little things with love, right? Yeah. And that's how you progress to be ready or to be worthy of that vocation, like you said. Like, maybe you're not worthy. Maybe you're not worthy of marriage either, right? So, like, you've got to work on that so that you can be worthy of the vocation that God has for you. Right? Every day. That's the point. So, alright, it's pretty late if you got a baby, so. They have commitments. Thank you very much. <laughs> 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 <laughs>